Let's see your Bibles this morning. Word. Let's see your pens. Pens. <laughs> see your bulletins. Bulletin. Okay, let's read our verse for the week. It says on three, one, two, three, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. One more time. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Turn please to Ezekiel chapter 1. As we're continually reading through the Bible, we are in the book of Ezekiel this week and next week. We are um, about, what's this, 2016 years ago, 15, 15 years ago, I first got into ministry. I retired from the NFL in August of 86, and in September of 86, I was working at Horizon. I was making $500 a month. I had a family, a house, two cars, and I had been making $9,000 a week playing football. So that was a little pay cut to $125 a week. And um, I was on a trip speaking in um, Oregon at, for a youth camp. And the youth pastor was a student at Multnomah Bible College. And so I did the camp. Then on Monday, uh, I went to the Bible College to chapel with him. And then I flew out. And I was sitting in Bible College. I'm 26 years old at the time. I'm in ministry. I had no education, no Bible education, other than what I read. And I watched, you know, a room like this full of students walk in and listen to this guy speak. And, I, and the Lord said to me, all these guys, were in, all these people are in school. They, they learn Hebrew, they're learning Bible history, church history. And you don't know Jack. <laughs> and I said, that's right. So I need to go back to school. And God said, you need to go back to school. And here I was making $125 a week which paid for my garage. <laughs> it was one-third of my house payment at the time. And um, I said, how am I going to go to school? I, mean, I can't even afford to live. He says, you, go, you need to go back to school. And the pastor, the guy doing the chapel, spoke about walking by faith. He talked about Abraham being called out of his land to follow God's calling on his life. And I never forget, it was, it was Genesis chapter 12. This was six, 15, 16, 15, year, 15 years ago. And that was a Monday. That Friday, I was standing at the office. Someone walked up behind me, and I wasn't, I was just had this thing on my mind. I got to go back to school. And someone put a brochure on my hand for Azusa Pacific. It was $744 a class. It was 166 units, uh, dollars a unit. It was more than I was getting paid a month. And... The thing said, if you go to school, you know, if you're on staff, here's a, you know, blah, 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 the deal you'll get. And that next Monday, which is a week later, I was in school. God spoke to me, and then he gave me an avenue to fulfill what he spoke to me. What I want to talk to you today about, and tomorrow, is about answering God's call. It may not be Rock You, but it's something. We are interviewing consultants to help us with our building project, to get our building, blah, 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 blah. And we've interviewed two people so far. We have a third company to interview this week. And after we interviewed the second company, the president of the company called us up. And he said on the phone, I'm calling you to sell you on us. Okay, I'm telling you now. I got my salesman hat on, and I want you to hire us. And so I'm going to tell you up front, today and next week, I want to challenge you to identify and respond to God's call in your life. That's what we're going to talk about. And so your homework for today and next week is going to be the same homework. 
is that you're going to write down, I want you to write down, God has called me to this, and then begin to write down your plan to implement it. The plan will be developed for the rest of your life, but you're going to write down, God's called me to do this, and here's what I'm going to start doing. For some of you, you're going to go to rocket training. For some of you, you're going to go to small group training. For some of you, you're going to just attend a small group. Some of you are going to just receive Christ as your Savior as step number one. Some of you are going to go to rock you, whatever it is, but it's going to be something. It's not going to be nothing. Amen? So I want you to be thinking this week and next week, and I've been praying all week, Holy Spirit, speak to these people about your call on their life. I cannot and will never try to tell you what that is. No one can tell you what that is. Now, people can tell you what they observe in your life as, as what they sense God's gift you to do, maybe what he's called you to do, but the bottom line is God is going to go, Psst, here's what I want you to do. Amen? So let's all bow for a prayer, and then I'm going to read a very strange chapter to you out of the Bible. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. Holy Spirit, I pray you would speak to everybody here. You know them. You know their pain. You know their, their joy. You know their gifts. You know why they exist, why they're here today, the plans you have for their life. Pray you make it very clear to them. Crystal, crystal clear. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, turn to Ezekiel 1. If you don't have a Bible, please try to read on with someone near you. Um, but listen very closely. This is going to be a very strange chapter. The stuff I'm going to read to you is going to be like, what is he talking about? But please bear with it, with me. It's in the Bible for a reason. Okay? It's uh, 28 verses we're going to read. It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabara, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Now, Ezekiel was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar raided Jerusalem. He raided Jerusalem three times. The first time he raided, he took a bunch of people. Part of that group was Daniel. The book of Daniel was written after Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were their Babylonian names. They were about 17, 18 years old when they were kidnapped. Ezekiel was the same age, but he wasn't kidnapped to the second time. And so he's a captive. He's a slave. He's in bondage. It's like, it's like Russia coming uh, or, or Phoenix coming here to raid San Diego and taking us captive and, and making us uh, uh, slaves in hot Phoenix. So now we're over there, and he's, he, he's there as a captive, and God is going to call him to ministry. And it says he's there by the river Chabar, and he sees a vision of God. Look what it says in verse 2. On the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth day, uh, year of King Jehoiakim, King, captivity, the word of the Lord came to me expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabara, and the hand of the Lord was upon me there. Now listen, to, look at what he sees. I looked and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, radiating out of its midst like the color of amber and out of the midst of the fire. Also from within, it came, from within it came the likeness of four creatures. How many creatures? And their appearance was appearance, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each had four faces. How many creatures? How many faces on each creature? And each had four wings. How many wings? So you have four creatures with four faces on each creature, and each had four wings. I ain't never seen nothing like that in my life. Verse 6, each had four faces, each had four wings, their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of the feet of a calf. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings and their four sides, and each of the four had four faces and four wings. Verse 9, their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each went straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, each one had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each four had the faces of an ox on the left side. And each had the face of an eagle on the other side. So you have four creatures, they have four faces. One's the face of an eagle, one's the face of an ox, one's the face of a man, and one's the face of a lion. Verse 11, 
Thus were their faces, their wings stretched out upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward, and they went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like flashing of lightning. And now as I looked, the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color barrel, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of the workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they moved, they went forward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome. Their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. So here you have this creature, four creatures. They had a face of a man, a lion, an eagle, and an ox. They have wheels in a wheel. So one wheel was facing this way turning, and one wheel in it was facing this way, and it can go either way, any direction. The wheels didn't have to turn. Then they had the wings. They have fire and lightning. This guy's tripping, okay? This is what he saw, but I know he's tripping. When he's seen all, he's going, man, what is this? But this is what he's seeing. Verse 19. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because there the Spirit went. And the wheels were lifted together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And when those went, these went. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. It was like a glass ceiling over them. So here, I'm a creature. I got my wings. I got my legs. I got my wheels. I got my four heads. And right above me is this glass floor. In verse 22, the likeness of the firmament or the glass floor above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight one toward another. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters. You like that sound effect, huh? Like the voice of the Almighty, atonement, like the noise of an army. And when they stood, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament, above the glass ceiling, that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. In appearance, like a sapphire stone, on the likeness of the throne was a likeness of an appearance of a man, high above it, God. Also from the appearance of his waist, the Lord's waist, and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's seeing Lord, the Lord on a chariot throne. He's on his throne. He's moving around. And he's got these four faces and these wings and these wheel within a wheel and this fire and lightning and color and this crystal floor. He's tripping. He's seeing God. And he's seeing God on the throne. And look what it says in verse, at the end of verse 28. So when I saw all this, I fell on my face and heard the voice of one speaking. And he said, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. Ezekiel's getting called into ministry. He's having what we call a spiritual crisis. He's seeing God. And he's falling on his face, and he's going, man, I'm seeing something I shouldn't be seeing. And he falls on his face out of humility, and then God speaks to him and says, Ezekiel, I'm calling you. God, whether it be something like this or a very small, still voice, is going to call you with a spiritual crisis. He may open the eyes of your heart. He may open the eyes of your ears. He may open so you can see, hear, sense. But what he wants you to do, some, in some way, he's going to give you a vision. He's going to speak to you. He's going to knock you on the head very gently, and you're going to go, cluck, cluck. 
This is what I'm called to do. And next week, we're going to continue this story in verse 2. We want to look at the three things he told Ezekiel and how he called him. But today, I just want to talk about being called. And I want you to be praying that God would give you an experience, maybe not as crazy as this, but we call a burning bush experience where God speaks to you and makes it clear to you, this is what I want you to do. Let me tell you what he doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to get saved, go to church, and that's it. He does not want you to do that. He wants you to do something very, very specific for him in building his kingdom. To be called means to be specifically contacted by God, to be invited and designated for something very specific. To be called by God is to be contacted by God to, and be invited and designated to do something very specific for him. What that is, is totally up to him. It is not up to you. It's up to him. Turn to, we're going to skip through the Bible, turn to the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 28, many of us have, know the first part of this verse, but it's always important to know the whole story. You don't ever want to pick verses out. You want to know the whole deal. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let me tell you something. All things don't work together for good. All things don't work together for good. It says, all things work together for good to those who, are call, who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Big difference. There are a lot of people right now who are having a lot of things happen in their life, they are going to die and go to hell. Ain't nothing good about that. But people who are, love God, who are obedient to God, and walk by faith, all things work together for good. Very different. So if you're a Christian today, or if you think you're a Christian, or you want to be a Christian, and you think, well, everything's going to work out for good, don't believe that. It only works out for good if you obey God. If I, I think last week I mentioned... Uh, if I start going out there and sinning and getting high or cheating on my wife or robbing banks, that ain't going to be good. And if I don't repent, that ain't going to be good. But if I o choose to obey God, all things work together for good. Now look what it says. To those who are called according to his purpose. When God invites you and calls you to something, Understand this, it is according to his purpose, not your purpose. And when he calls you to something, you are going to get this feeling, this sense, this voice, this experience or whatever, or this desire or interest to do something. And it may not necessarily be something you would have normally thought to do on your own. It may not be something you think you're equipped to do. It may not be something you think that anyone would want you to do or would let you do. That doesn't matter. The, what matters is that God has chosen you to do it. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. You can't start thinking about, do I have the money? Or am I going to get accepted? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I've been in trouble before. Or maybe I'm not qualified or I'm not educated. Don't worry about any of that. You ever ask a little kid what they want to be when they grow up? Oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to play in the NFL. I want to play baseball and hockey. And I want to be a pilot. They have no idea what they're saying. Then they grow up and realize, I don't like blood. <laughs> I can't, I, I hate football. I'm scared of little baseball. I don't like ice. And they start crossing stuff out, and they realize, okay, I'll work at Vons. <laughs> I'll work at Vons. God is looking for someone who will hear his voice and say, yes, sir. And not say, but what about this? 
And what about this? And what about this? You will drive, you won't drive God crazy. You'll drive people crazy saying, I feel like I'm supposed to do this, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about, is that driving you crazy? What about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about, if that drives you crazy, don't do that to me today, okay? What about this? And what about this? And what about all this? <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> That's the good part. If you had it figured out, it's probably not God. What I mean by that, God's not going to say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk to your car. Come on. He's going to tell you to go design a car. He's not going to tell you something you can do. He's going to tell you something you're going to go, oh, man, I could never do that. That's God. All those obstacles... That's the fun part. That's the fun part. That's what, that's God. When he starts knocking down obstacles, let's not go there yet. All you have to decide is this is what I'm called to do. And God is going to tell you some amazing things. Remember last week we talked about Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will tell you great mighty things you don't know. God, what do you want me to do? Oh, are you ready to listen? You know, I'm not going to tell you because you won't even listen to me. You won't believe me. He's a... <laughs> He's looking for someone who's going to believe him. It's according to his purpose. It's not according to your purpose. Turn to Exodus, the second book in the Bible, 31. Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Another thing about being called is that God will gift you with everything you need to do everything he's called you to do. He will equip you with everything you need. Look what it says in chapter 31, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. I've called him. Uh, uh, underline called by name. Called by name. Out of the womb. Out of the womb. And look what it says in verse 3. And I have, look what he did. I filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels, for setting, in carving wood, and work in all manner of workmanship. What does that tell you? When you want something done with jewels, with bronze and cutting, you get this guy. You don't ask this guy to be the speaker. You don't ask this guy to be the administrator. You don't have this guy typing letters. You have this guy doing exactly that. Some of your lives are like grinding here. Ah, my life is going nowhere. Why? Because you're not doing what God has gifted you to do. You are not doing what God has given when you. When God puts you right where you are, are gifted to do, it is so much fun. Like we have uh, many... Obviously, at our ministry, we have 40 people, and everybody has different gifts. And we have ladies on our staff that are organized. <laughs> organized. You just throw stuff out of them, and they're just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're like this, like this. You just like, I want to do this. They ask a couple questions, but up, but up, but up, but up. Then they go away, they disappear. And they go back and they go, eh, 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 and it comes out looking good. That's because they're a gift. Then you get other people who aren't organized, and you talk to them, and they go, okay. Okay. They don't write anything down. Okay. And you go, you got that? 
I think so. <laughs> Week later. So how's that process going? Uh, I, really, I really didn't understand what you said. <laughs> You're in the wrong job. <laughs> you need to be over here. When God calls you to something, God is going to equip you to do it. Period. And or he's going to equip you to deal with the people who are going to do it with you. Some of you, you ladies out there, some of your husbands will never fix your car. They will never put in those cabinets that they've been promising. You will never get that tile floor through them. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Sorry. Now, go hire someone but they ain't going to do it. Is that bad? No. You know what? They just, they don't have it. My brother-in-law, I, I'm, I'm that way. I, I ain't putting in no floors. <laughs> it's not because I don't want to. It's not because it's a below me. Now, I, I put in a yard. I go out there and dig dirt and, you know, lay, plant, plant. I, and I've done a lot of that. But, you know, the other stuff, my brother-in-law, he's like Mr. Fix-It. He's got every new tool that comes out on the little TV thing. He's writing a number down, going to get the little thing. He puts on a tool belt to change a light bulb. <laughs> he loves to have his steel shank boots on. That's his thing. And everybody is gifted. And in the spirit of, in the kingdom of God, God has spiritually, spiritual gifts for you to do spiritual things according to his spiritual purpose, according to building his spiritual kingdom. That's even far beyond having a tool belt. That's the most important, the most exciting thing. There is absolutely nothing in your life, nothing, and there never will be nothing in your life more important than you doing what God has called you to do. End of story. I don't care what your career is. I don't care what your education is. I don't care how much money you're making. There is nothing in life more important than God's calling your life. Now, being a good parent is, is God's calling your life. Being a good husband and a wife, all that's part of God's call. But then there's something that he wants you to do for him in his kingdom. And for some people, maybe just raising their kids. But you know what? You need to know. God told you to do that. Turn to, and he's equipped you. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. We are like that clay, and he's the potter. He's shaping us. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is not only going to call you, invite you, designate you. He's not only going to gift you. He's going to prepare the environment prepare, excuse me, circumstances, people to come alongside with you. You're not going to do it by yourself. It's a team. I, t I spoke uh, two weeks ago, our first Sunday here, that I wanted to take um, an African-American man who just got out of prison, non-Christian, to Africa with us. And he was a young man sitting over here I, that I had not met, but I see him here all the time. And he was sitting there. He told his girlfriend, uh, we need help with going to Africa. And he said that when he first heard about it a few months ago. And then he said it again two weeks ago. And so I talked about taking this guy. I don't you know how it's going to work, but I just had this idea that I want to do this. And so I'm standing out in the lobby, and he walks by, and he waves. And his girlfriend says, you need to talk to Miles now about that because he is a district attorney here in town. And he said, nah, I'll just email him. He don't have my email address. So he walks away, and I call him. I say, hey, I didn't know, him, know his name. I just, I don't know how I got his attention. I said, can you come here? And his girlfriend says, oh, God's going to make you talk to him now. Because <laughs> he's thinking, you know, I'll just, I, I need to talk to him, but I'm not going to do it. God will whisper something to you. Don't tell God you're going to do it later. Do it then. 
So he said, oh, I don't talk to him. I feel like I should talk to him, but not now. And, and God says, no, you call him. So I, I call him over. So we go in the back, and I start telling him about this idea. And he heard me speak about it. He says, listen, I work with these guys. I, I work with uh, gang members, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's a great idea. Here's how we can do it. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, and you know what he says to me? He says, you know, some of these guys I prosecute can't read. We got, that was part of this whole conversation. I said, we as a church need to help people how to read. Why can't somebody in here God speak to and say, you're going to help people to read? See, probably most of y'all know how to read. And you think people don't know how to read? There are plenty of adults in this town who cannot read. So what do you think they're going to do? Well, I can tell you what a whole bunch of stuff they're never going to do. Anything that requires reading. So why can't we as a church, as Christians say, who needs to read? We want to help you read. And obviously part of the class is going to be reading the Bible. We're going to help you read. And if God has put that on your heart, guess what? You need to say, I'm going to act on that. It's something so simple. And my point in telling you this is that God is going to give you this little whisper. He's going to give you this little invitation. He's going to speak to you. And you would think, well, it's, that's out there. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. How am I going to do that? And you need to say, I'm not going to wait for all the circumstances to fall in. I'm going to start walking in it because there are other people God has spoken to, like when that guy was there. And he's saying, I do this. I can be part of that, getting that guy to Africa. I can be part. I can tell you how, it's, how it could work out. And, and, and someone here is saying, I want to, someone came to us after first service says, I want to be part of it. I want to help people how to read. Boom. God speaks to you. God has already lined his people up to help you and facilitate the implementation of his vision and call on your life. You have to believe that. You can't wait around for all the pieces to fall in place in front of you. That's not faith. That's fear. That's doubt. That's like a confidence in God. The next thing it says, turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith, now I'm going to give you about six, seven, eight things to underline. That's the first one. By faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. By faith, it says, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive, right? Would receive, uh, underline would receive as an inheritance. Would receive, future. By faith... He would receive. And then it says, he went out not knowing. Underline, not knowing. He went out not knowing where he was going. But by faith, underline, by faith, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise. Underline, promise. As in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Write down promise. Promise. I mean, underline promise. And then it says in verse 10, for he waited, underline waited, for the city which has foundations, whose builder is God, builder and maker is God. What is my point? Is that God is going to tell you something ridiculous. Psst. Give your heart to Jesus. Psst. Become a small group facilitator. Move to China. <laughs> For real. Psst. Go to Rock U. Go to Rock Head. Go to the Rock. <laughs> Psst. Something. Help kids read. Help adults read. And you're going to go, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Let me tell you what you do. Watch this. Take a step of faith. And start pursuing it. That's it. Don't wait around. Okay. Send me a sign, God. 
He just did. He spoke to you. And it's like, it's like you hear it over and over and over again. Then you see someone over there doing it, and you go, oh, I want to do that. Then you see it on TV. I want to do that. Then you hear about it on the radio. I want to do that. Then you hear about it at church. Then you hear about some people talking. He's like, it keeps coming to me. It keeps coming to me. Then you have to walk by faith. This is where the rubber meets the road with so many people. Now, I, I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to take a poll. I just want to take a poll. How many of you, and I'll ask you to raise your hand. So get your arm ready because you're all going to raise your hand. How many of you in some form or another had some sense, and it could be a tiny, tiny or a very profound sense that you kind of think maybe possibly you feel God potentially has called you to do something? Look at all your hands. <laughs> Can you do that one? Keep your hands up. Look around the room, everybody. Look at all those peoples. Okay, now, here's what I want you to do. I can end my sermon right now then. I got seven minutes. Before you leave here today, I want you to write that down, whatever that is. Before you leave here today, I want you to write it down. Before you leave here today, I want you to write it down. Okay? And I want you to, by faith, be praying about what you're going to do about it. We want to help you in whatever this is all about. We want to help you in whatever this is all. If all of you called the office in the next month, we'd be overrun, but we still want to help you. Don't let anybody get in your way of fulfilling this. When I got this, and, and I'm a, uh, you know, some of y'all may be a lot more passive than me, not bad or good, it's just different. Some of you may be more laid back, more patient, that may be a better way of saying it. For me, it was like I was bugging people, okay? If God has called you, you better go do it, and you better not let any man or any church or any organization stop you or frustrate you out of it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because that's between you and God. So by faith, here's a rubber meets the road. All of you raise your hand. God has spoken to me. And the difference between the people it happens for and the difference between the people it doesn't happen for, ha happens for, has nothing to do with another person. It has to do with you and God. Because if God has called you to do something and you say, God, I'm ready to go, who am I and how could I ever get in the way? I can't. It's impossible. I'm nothing. I'm like a little bug to God. He could just, he could deal with that. So what you need to do, because I've talked to so many people this week who have no idea I was going to talk about this, saying, how do you know God is calling you? What do I do? I kind of feel this. Go do it. The guy said to me, I, I said, what do you want to do? He said, well, I kind of feel like I want to teach. Go be a small group facilitator. There's a small group table right out there to the right. Done. Go to Rocket Training. Go to Rocket University. Go move wherever he's telling you to move. Done. Done. I feel like he's telling me to pray. Go pray. I feel like he's telling me to read the Bible. Go read the Bible. I feel like he's telling me to love my husband. Go love your husband. I feel like he's telling me to be a better parent. Go be a better parent. Go find out how to be a better parent. Find a good parent and ask him how they do it. <laughs> Get a book. Go to a class. Go to a seminar. Go to a conference. Do something, but don't sit there and go, give me another sign, God. Let me tell you something. God, God has spoken to me countless times, speaks to me every day, every day. And you say, how do I know? Well, there's a lot of ways, but I'll tell you some simple ways. I hear this voice. Sounds like my voice. And he just says, uh, go over there and do that. And because of years of doing it and the way he's wired me to be a spontaneous person, I go do it. And how do I know I keep listening the whole time I'm pursuing whatever it is he's telling me to do. And a lot of times I find out that God has not called me to finish it when he stops me. If he doesn't stop me, I'm going to do it. So here I am, he go, and, and, and God in heaven, and he talks, you know, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and he, he says, watch this, y'all. Hey, Miles, go over there and talk to that guy. Hopefully, I go, okay, and I go do it. Now, if he don't want me to do it, he'll stop me. He'll have the guy run away. I'll be like, what was that all about? And he'll go, I just want to see you do it. I just want to watch these guys. I'll be doing do it. 
My point is this, is that when you feel God telling you to do something, go do it. He will stop you. He will redirect you. But don't let it not happen for lack of effort on your part. Don't let it not happen for lack of faith on your part. I told you, I've been joking that I wanted to be in the movies. And I know y'all laugh at me and uh, all that stuff. But I'm going to tell you something, make you a little jealous. <laughs> I like it. I was practicing because I, when I, I want to be in a movie. I want to be a guy who, one of the many roles I want to play. <laughs> I want to be a guy who gets saved, right? Or a guy and a guy who becomes, you know, a minister, whatever. And I wanted to be like, like you know, something like on a drug addict who gets saved. So I was practicing my drug addict. <laughs> so I was in Denny's the other day. I was in the, in the mirror practicing, right? Just trying to get, you know, come off my fix, right? So I was in the Denny's the other day with a guy. And I was like, hey, here's my, here's my role. Watch this. How, how, how I look. And I was doing this. Everyone in the Denny's was looking at me like, <laughs> what's up with that brother? But we had this vision to do a movie. So we're right now working on this script. And we're also right now working on making a video that we pray will go on MTV, about 30 minutes show. Um, and it's gospel related, but I don't have time to get into it, but it's going to be the bomb. But let me tell you this. Six years ago, we did our first crusade and we edited it on and filmed it and put it on this uh, digital machine uh, at a man's house in Rancho Santa Fe. And the 16 year old kid who edited it, oh, it was a 16 year old kid who edited it, it, it. And I told the man who owned the equipment, I want to own your equipment. I want, you, I want it. So he says, well, it's mine. <laughs> I know, but I want it to be mine. <laughs> it, it, we had this conversation in a very friendly way. But, you know, he, and, and it's mine. I own it now. <laughs> he practically gave it to us. But he was very nice, and he, you know, he, he said, I, I don't need all this. And I said, well, I would like to have it, and you know, somehow I would like to get it from you. He said, okay, we'll work that out. And we did, so I own it. And so I don't own it. The ministry owns it. But the kid who was editing it, he was 16. He knew how to do uh, his, his avid machine. He, he was amazing. Well, he went to UCLA, and he is completing his degree in film. And we've been talking about him coming, helping us put together this film. He's been interning for the last two years with the Billy Graham Association in their film department, making films. <laughs> There's somebody out here who's interested in that. And God has spoke to you about it. And you said, there a movie? When would God, God is saying, let's go. I don't know what God's called you to do, but I want you to write it down. And I want you to make a decision that starting today, you're going to be, begin to pursue it. Chapin talked about at The Rock, you're going to have these interns, on, um, interns at the office. We have so much ministry, so much ministry to be done. And it's only going to happen when our leadership grows, our team grows. And it's going to be because God is going to call individuals out of this church and from around the world. There's a guy here from Connecticut. There's another guy here from Tennessee who flew in to um, interested in getting involved in some way or another. And one guy in Connecticut, he just saw my picture and God told him, you need to go. And he just bought a ticket and came out here. And, and he's like, I want to do something. And God is going to call you. And you know what? The people who have the faith to say, yes, sir, whatever you want. That's as quick as it can happen. But if you sit around for 10 years, 15 years, well, they never gave me a chance. And they never called me up. Or they didn't want to pay me a whole lot of money. Now, that's probably not going to happen. I'll tell you that now. God is going to go, Psst, and you're going to say yes. And you're going to walk by faith. It is going to be a process of faith. When I first got in ministry, and I was, they told me they were going to pay you $125 a week. I said, how am I going to live? God is going to take care of you. And he did. He did. And so all of you who raise your hand, before you leave here, I want you to write down what, you, what he's called you to do. I want you to pray about uh, going to the rock you. Is it a sacrifice? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Is it a step of faith? Absolutely. Is it based on what God's called you to do? Absolutely. But whatever it is, whether it's rock you or whatever, I want you to be praying that God, I, I want to do this. Next week, we're going to continue this at Montezuma Hall. We're going to be over there. God, I want to start walking in it. You don't necessarily have to leave your job today. With everybody, it's going to be different. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, I want to be a speaker and travel around the country. When I go out in these things, I meet these youth pastors. And you know what I tell them? The only thing I can tell you is to obey God. Because how it happened to me, it can never, I, I couldn't even map it out for you. It was so odd. It was so coincidental. There is no A, B, C plan. It is, I obey God today, and it happens. I obey God tomorrow, and it happens. I obey God, and God supernaturally does supernatural things to get you to where he wants you to be. Only you, your only thing is to obey by faith. I know I'm three minutes over. One more verse, and we're going to get out of here. Look up Habakkuk. Actually, that may take you about 40 minutes. Habakkuk chapter 2, and we'll go after this. Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Or Habakkuk. Or Habakkuk. <laughs> However you want to pronounce it. Habakkuk. Chapter 2. But I like two. <laughs> Don't you love, I mean, I do. I love people who speak languages that have no similarity to English. Like, not like Spanish is kind of English, French, you know, but like an Indian dialect. I was in the, the grocery store and this guy yelled at his kid was making noise. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, what do you got? If you say that to your kids, they look at you like, big man. That's how English sounds to them. Verse 1. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk asked God a question, and he's telling, he's saying here, I'm going to wait to see what God answers me and what he says. Look what, he said, look what the Lord says. Write the vision and make it plain, simple, understandable, readable, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Write it down. Hey, church, I wrote things down 10 years ago that are just now happening. 10 years ago. Write it down. Write it down every day. If you cannot write down your vision, if you cannot write down what God's called you to do, you do not know what he called you to do. You have to be able to write it down and read it. And someone unknown can look at it and go, I got it. That takes W-O-R-K. And you will come say, I feel like I want to do this. I feel like I want to do this. I feel like I want to do this. And I will say to you, write it down. And many times, never see the people again. Because they go, oh, it's too hard. I can't. Can't you just do it for me? <laughs> no. So I'm, my challenge to you is to write it down. My challenge to you is and, and, and get a brochure. Be praying about going to the school. But more than that, be praying about God. I'm here. I have never been more excited in my life than now because of what God is doing in my life and clarifying his call on my life and how to get there. And probably the most important, the most, one of the most important things is having a staff that is enabling me, enabling me to dream. I was doing a Pop Warner, my Pop Warner uh, practice 
And we were running sprints at the end. This little kid in our team, his name is um, Cameron Bagby. I think his first name is Cameron. We call him Bagby. He's from Iran. He's one of the shortest kids on the team, but absolutely one of the strongest leaders and fastest kids on the team. So we got all these kids lined up, two lines, we're running sprints. And the coach is going to say, go, go. But he's got the ball in front of him. And the kid's not supposed to move until they do this. So if you jump offside, the guy that you're running to backs up five yards. So the coach goes, go, go. The kids jump offside. Coach turns around and says, back up. So all the other kids start yelling, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Just pay attention. Coach goes, go, go. Kids jump offside. He turns around and says, back up. Oh, come on, man. Come on, man. They start yelling. And they're tired. And they don't want to get practice done. And little Bagby sitting next to me. And he says, what are you, stupid? And I say, hey, no calling people stupid. I didn't call them stupid. No, call I didn't no calling people stupid. I just asked a question, Coach Miles. <laughs> <laughs> No saying stupid. No saying stupid. So the first line goes, then Bagby gets up. I love this kid. He gets up. He gets on line. Then he jumps offside. <laughs> so then they run to come back, and he's running back. He's always like first or second. He's just kid. Some of these kids, they're like just so amazingly grown in how they work. Their work ethic is amazing. So I go, Bagby, come here. I go, Bagby, how come we're not supposed to call people stupid? Oh, because we're a team coach? That's right. How come else? Oh, because we got to stick together, coach? I said, how come else? Oh, I said, because you jumped off too. <laughs> you don't want anyone calling you stupid. I said, we're all going to make mistakes. We got to stick together. The only way we're going to do this is if we stick together. All of us in here. And my job, one of my jobs, is to encourage you, not that the devil discourage you and call you stupid. God has called you. He has. And he's waiting for you to play. He's waiting for you to get in the game. So let's go. We have ways for you to get in. There may be other ways that God chooses for you. Fine, but just do it. Just do it. He's calling somebody right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is God. Turn that phone off. <laughs> Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, there's a lot of firepower in this room. There is fire power in this room. The devil is strategizing right now how he can confuse everybody. There he is, calling us again. The devil right now doesn't want people to write their vision. He doesn't want them to believe that you would call them. He doesn't want them to believe that you would use them. He wants them to put it off one more day. He wants them to think about all the excuses, the reasons why it won't work, why they, they, they don't have experience, they don't have the money, they don't have the backing, they don't have any friends, they don't have the support system. All the millions of excuses, the church won't let them, the pastors won't call them back, whatever it is, he's going to tell them, he's going to lie to them. I pray that these thousand people or so would not let that happen that they would be fiendish about writing it down and pursuing it. Determined. And that they would do it as onto the Lord, not onto the rock, as onto Jesus. And if God has called you, you rose your hand, now it's time to inquire, investigate, write down what it is and pursue it. Lord, for those who need to be facilitators, small group, speak to them. For those who need to go to Rockhead training, Rock University, whatever it is you want them to do, to be an usher, to do miles ahead, all the countless opportunities, speak to them. Lord, get them excited. Their life is going to change. Their life is going to have eternal purpose. Get them excited. Like fire in their bones, burn this passion. Don't let them be bumps on a log. In Jesus' name, amen. I can sit there and talk to you all day, and I know you don't want to hear that, but... I